Mr. Nandan will be sharing his insights on democratizing AA, the time is now, and here's how in a fireside chat with Mr. Amol Dete. With over 15 years of experience in finance journalism, Amol has worked at CNBC, TV18, Z Business, and DNA. He is famous for his sharp editorials and his special show, uh, FinTech Diary. And we are all thrilled to have him with us today. How many of you are waiting to listen to him talk? Now the hands go up. <laughs> okay, before he comes on stage, Mr. Nandan is gonna say a few words and we're all eagerly waiting to listen to him. Uh, friends, it's, it's really great to be here at this Samvad event organized by Samati, I think, uh, you know, you get a sense, a palpable sense of the excitement, the energy, the fact that so many hundreds of people are here, that the whole idea of account aggregator is reaching a point of takeoff, that it's going to get into the next orbit. And sometimes when we're in, we're in the middle of all it, you don't really uh, realize how, how important these points are. Just to give an idea, 2016 was probably the most important year in the history of India's digital infrastructure. And while we were in 2016, we didn't think about it. On April 4, 2016, India reached 1 billion Aadhaars. So 1 billion people had an Aadhaar on April 4, 2016. On April 11, 2016, UPI was launched uh, by the governor of the central bank. And it was an event in the Taj. I remember, I don't even think the crowd was as big as this. On September 5, 2016, Geo launched Geo Network and transformed mobile connectivity. Somewhere around that time, we had a meeting at the RBI and RBI proposed, we, you know, we had the discussion on how do we create, uh, you know, the whole idea of consent and all that. And RBI had come up with the genius idea of account aggregator and that idea was cemented. And then finally, on November 8, 2016, we had demonetization. So fundamentally, in the same year, uh, lots of things happened, and that laid the foundation for the change that we see today. Similarly, today, I think, when I see this gathering, when I see the, not only the scale of the gathering, but the sophistication of conversations, the sophistication of ideas, you get a sense that we're really at a point of takeoff. Now, I think the notion that you need to have digital public infrastructure at population scale, with interoperable standards, allowing innovation to flourish, is now getting widely accepted around the world. Uh, this year is India's presidency of the G20, and uh, we have had many meetings on the G20 where more and more countries are looking, are really impressed by India's digital transformation. Recently, the Quad had a meeting and they talked about DPI, uh, the Indo-EU Indo Indo uh, Council met in Stockholm last week. They talked about DPI and so on. So fundamentally, I think the notion of digital public infrastructure has now taken root around the world. And many, many people want to understand what we have done in India, how we made it happen, how we created this transformation, and they all would like to apply it to themselves. Now, in this transformation, I think the AA system is hugely important. It's very, very strategic. Because a lot of the things we have done have been transactional in nature, allowing, you know, using UPI to make payments or using Aadhaar to do a KYC. But the notion of using one's own data to improve one's lives or one's business is a dramatically different concept. Because we all know that Data is a byproduct of digital activity. That's, that's a given. Every time we have an interaction with any system, it generates a digital footprint, a digital trail. And what we have seen so far is because of the nature of data concentration that can happen, invariably these data is either in, in the com large companies, which then use them to sell ads to you or whatever, or it's with governments which often use it for surveillance and so on. So fundamentally, we all realize that data is a byproduct of all our activity and we are going to do more and more activity. But 
we have tended to think about data as something we have aggregated in, in businesses or in governments. And therefore, a huge conversation on data is how do we ensure that citizens are protected from that and therefore the whole issue of privacy and so on comes in because of that. But what I think India's account aggregator system has done has essentially put data, flipped it around and said, given that we are going to have large amount of digital footprints that come out of our activity, is there a way to put this in the hands of the people who own that data so that they can use it for improving their life? And that's really what the account aggregator system does. And think about it, at population scale, a billion people, millions of small businesses can use their digital footprint to improve their lives. Now this can be in different ways. Clearly the most, uh, the, use, the use case which is very compelling of course is lending, which means that small businesses can get access to credit using the digital invoices or the digital payment record. Individual consumers can get access to credit using the salary slip and their financial transactions. But the important thing about the account aggregator model is it is cross-sectoral. So in, one is within the financial sector itself, it is across uh, you know, banking, capital markets, insurance, pensions, mutual, you know, all, the whole, all the whole gamut of things and the same architecture applies to all of them. But it's also cross-sectoral in the sense that this infrastructure can be applied beyond financial markets. It can be used for skills, educational records, and so on, health records. In fact, the NHA is using the AA architecture for health records. So fundamentally, this cross-sectoral, cross-industry approach to data, which allows a billion people and millions of businesses to use their own data to advance their lives, I think is very, very important. And that's why the concept of digital capital or information collateral, how do we energize or unlock digital capital? Because in a country like India, financial cap people may not have financial capital. And especially if you're a first-timer in the world, first-time graduate from your family, first-time person from your household to get a formal job, you don't have financial capital, but you do have digital capital because the moment you start transacting, the moment you start doing things, then you create digital capital. And then if you harness that digital capital for yourself, then you have a way to improve your life. And that's really why the power of the idea is so much, that we are unlocking digital capital. It also means that it lays the foundation for uh, formalization because the challenge that India and many countries face is how do you create large formal economies? Because in many of these countries, there's a very small, narrow formal economy. There's a very narrow base of people in the system. There's a very narrow base of taxpayers. And a lot of people are outside the system. And historically, there has been no incentive for someone to join the system because joining the system only meant more cumbersome bureaucracy and joining in the system means having to pay taxes and all the other consequences of formalization. What the AA architecture does is actually provides the grand bargain for people, saying that if you join the formal economy, then we will give you a way to use your data to get ahead in life. And this is the reason, the incentive for people to join the system. So the small business who joins the system, the MSME that Mr. Raman talked about, which essentially says, can, I can now use my invoice details from my GST filings to show what I'm purchasing. I can use my UPI payment details from my consumer transactions to show how much I'm selling. I can use my tax returns to show how much taxes I pay. And I can put all this together as information collateral or digital capital, give it to a lender, and that lender can now make a decision whether I'm worthy of a loan, entirely on my digital footprint. Now that's an extremely powerful idea that digital capital can now be used by, monetized by individuals, not by companies, but by individuals to improve their lives. And this is what is happening now. And imagine that this is happening at population scale. We are the, just at the beginning of this journey. When I mean, all of you build those great innovations, those great applications, great companies of great value, whatever you're doing, 
I think you're going to see the full impact of this because this is also the fundamental basis for inclusive growth. Because how do you use digital economy to drive inclusive growth? And that's a big problem in the world because you know, the digital economy tends to concentrate winners and a few winners and lots of losers. How do we create where everybody's a winner? And that's what AA does, it allows everyone to be a winner. It allows every individual and every business to participate in the economy. Everyone to get, for example, if 20, there are 12 million businesses in GST system. Imagine those, those, those firms have had great difficulty in getting access to credit because you know, the information asymmetry and for banks it's too costly to find out whether they deserve a loan, they don't have any collateral and therefore they're out of the system and you know, few large guys get the loans. But imagine if the 12 million businesses who are in GST can transact and leverage their digital capital to get credit. Suddenly 12 million people have access to capital, can grow, can hire two people, create 20 million jobs, suddenly you have inclusive growth. So account aggregator actually is at the heart of creating inclusive growth in India. And the important thing is the architecture is unique because around the world there have been many attempts to create different ways of open data. But typically the challenge has been how does one drive consent? How, do, how does individuals and businesses get access to the data? And typically the consent is either with the user of the data, the, the, what we call as the financial information user, or it's the provider. But if the consent and the provider is, is sort of bundled together, that creates sort of conflicts of interest. And therefore, I think the genius of the Indian idea, and all credit goes to RBI for that, is the notion that the account aggregator is an impartial, independent player, regulated by the central bank for all the regulators, and they act as your fiduciary to make sure your data comes from the right place and is given to the right place. So I think the architecture of having these account aggregator is a brilliant idea, entire credit to RBI, and I think that really lays the foundation for a very good system. And additionally, the account aggregator themselves don't, cannot see the data. So the risk that all the data going through them then becomes, you know, used in anywhere else, that's all been removed. So I think this is a hugely important strategic part of uh, uh, the system to have account aggregators as independent consent managers, if you will. And that's part of why I think we have an architecture for scale, an architecture which allows massive innovation because this can be applied in any sector for any use case. We saw today examples of five different categories, but there may be a hundred categories. Because the best thing about innovation is that once you build the rails, once you build open APIs, once you allow markets to operate on a level playing field, then the innovation will be huge. And we ourselves will not be able to see that innovation. I mean, five years back, if you had told me about something called Soundbox, what is the Soundbox? But today, you go to any small darshini, any small restaurant, there's the Soundbox. You know? Pay as Paytm as Google, everybody has a sound box. The idea is simple that that guy running that counter is so busy that he doesn't have time to give the dosa and take the payment. And if you give the dosa, it says you pay 100 rupees, and then I go to the sound box and I beam it with UPI, and the sound box types up and says received 100 rupees, then I can do the next dosa without it's a hands free payment. So this is an innovation that, you know, who would have thought about this, right? Millions of shops have it today. So fundamentally, I think in the AA system also, you're going to see massive innovation and all of you are going to make it happen. And that innovation is going to drive massive use cases and transformation. And the, ultimately, we want to make sure that vegetable vendor who every day takes a loan at exorbitant rates to buy vegetables to sell, that person should get a loan, and I think some of the use cases you're talking today, I think, are like that. And then we'll have brought not just a digital transformation, but a social transformation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. So you answered all my questions. I actually don't have <laughs> any, any question as such. We can talk but about the weather or something. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but great to see the hall full here. 
Uh, before I begin, just one small anecdote. Uh, I was also moderating one session at Singapore FinTech Festival a couple of years back, and I asked the guy who does the content there, who's the top speaker there? He says, Bill Gates. I says, okay, I would like to hear him. And he says, you know whom, whom Bill Gates would like to hear? I says, who? He says, Nanda Nilekani. <laughs> so, it's, it's a pleasure to share a stage with you. Uh, thank you so much. So, my first question is specifically about the AA itself, account aggregator. You spoke about inclusive growth. We are mostly talking about the credit as one of the pillar uh, for the account aggregator. What are the other areas do you think that account aggregator can do a massive innovation and maybe, you know, add to the inclusive growth going ahead? No, I think, uh, see, whenever you bring in a new innovation, you need some engine driver of that and, and obviously credit is going to be that for businesses, individuals, everything. So I think that's good. But I think as you saw today, there are many, many use cases. I think capital markets will be huge. Uh, the fact that uh, we'll be able to create, I think financial literacy is going to be a big issue in India because you are moving a society which either has no assets or has assets in the form of real estate and gold, you're moving them to financial assets. And now if there's a way to help guide people on their financial assets, make the right decisions and so on, get the right balance of bonds, stocks, whatever. So all that are all innovations that somebody is out here is dreaming up. So I think that's another one. I think insurance, how do you make sure that insurance underwriting, small value insurance, how do you make sure the guy gets insurance for very small transactions? Again, you need data for that. So look, the thing with all this stuff is we don't know what we have unleashed in terms of innovation. Uh, valid point, sir, meaningful one. Uh, in the morning, we had Anand Nageshwaran, and he also spoke about democratizing and how innovation the AA will add. But one important point he spoke about is, uh, you know, the guardrails needs to be put in place so that we can prevent the misuse because the worry is this that with the account aggregator or so many fintech companies coming, the data is being exposed to the financial institutions in, in millions of, you know, uh, gigabytes. So what kinds of strategies do you think that the account aggregators or this new age company should put in place so that they can prevent a mechanism to, you know, the data remain safe? No, I think the good thing about these initiatives in India is that they are techno-legal in nature or techno-regulatory in nature. They're done in conjunction with the regulators. So the regulators led by the RBI are very much part of this. And so I think a lot of the guardrails are there. For example, encryption. When the data comes from the source to the destination, it's fully encrypted, digitally signed. Uh, consent artifacts. Praveen now talked about the fact that you can actually say what kind of consent, consent for one week, consent for one use, whatever it is, you can give consent. That's very, it's a very unique thing. Then uh, only, your data can only be shared with your consent. So there's a privacy thing. And only for the purpose that you give it. So a lot of the guardrails are actually there uh, in the system. And of course, once the data privacy law comes, it'll be sanctified in law. So I think there is a lot of, this is not, this is not giving, give your password to somebody and then he'll get all your statements. This is not one of those things. This is actually using, you know, systematic, traceable uh, artifacts to uh, check that uh, it's really consent. Okay. Uh, sir, in my observation, considering the current digital innovation, I have been a finance journalist. If you look at, we have 12 PSU banks, more than 20 private banks, some 40, 50 mutual fund companies and similar number of insurance companies. I think we took 100 years to build these 200 strong financial institutions. But in just last 10 years, we have built more than 3,000 fintech companies, out of which maybe 23 are unicorns and 2-3 are listed companies already. Considering the scale and speed, what kind of digital innovation do you see now specifically into the financial domain? Because that's what a lot of us would like to hear. Well, I think, first of all, I think everybody has a role to play. I mean, I think banks are, you know, the custodians of money. And as we have seen today in what's happened in Silicon Valley Bank or Credit Suez, I mean, if custodians of money have a problem, then there's a problem, macroeconomic problem for the society. So I think banks have to be very safe custodians of money. And I think in the Indian model, it's make sure the banks play the role they have. They come under the RBI, Regulated Payment and Settlement Act and all that. And fintechs often can do the innovative part, but often they have to partner with banks. And I think the UPI infrastructure is an example of that, where the banking, bank account is in the banking system. 
but your app could be any any app from anyone and therefore i think that that separation of responsibility in some sense in a way that regulated stuff is inside the regulated system is i think very important and the same thing will be true in the uh, account but i think the key thing is what you're seeing is a massive transformation right you're going from an informal to a formal economy you're going from assets being in real estate and gold to assets being in financial assets you're going from a tax to gdp ratio which is already at about 11.7% going up to maybe 10 50 maybe 15% which means there'll be more taxes paid which means more money for investment in infrastructure and welfare programs you're going to see uh, essentially people parlaying their digital capital to improve their lives you're going to see a movement from a prepaid economy to a posted postpaid economy i mean the the great innovation of the mobile companies was the prepaid mobile phone where you pay money and you get talk time and then you use the talk time. So they didn't have to worry about your credit. But in the postpaid economy, you are giving credit in advance. How do you do that with AA? So I think multiple transformations are going to happen and I think many, many companies are going to create huge impact. And even in the banking sector, the RBI has been come up with new models, payment banks, small banks, all that. So I think it's a very, very diversified uh, financial ecosystem very well regulated. I mean, India is one of the few countries that has two-factor authentication on all payments. You know, in many parts of the world is still one factor, which means you're more fraud. Here we have had two-factor. Mr. Gandhi is part of that uh, right from the beginning. So these are all well thought through uh, mechanisms to create scalable but safe uh, financial systems. Okay, noted your point, sir. But going ahead, how do you think the regulators will play a major role? The great part is obviously regulator is already taking initiatives in the innovation. But a couple of uh, hazardous activity also happened on the fintech side in the BNPL or the digital lending side. A couple of privacy issues also happened in the payment side. So how regulator can be more active? How do you read the regulator steps going no, ahead? I, I think this is going to be a constant back and forth. I think there will be a lot of financial innovators. Hmm. They will all push the envelope on regulation. Then the, the regulator will come in and try to streamline it. There'll be one more set of, you know. so you're going to have this cycle of innovation, regulation, innovation, regulation in every sector. Okay, but do you see also need for the regulators to come together and work, for example, say, be RBI, PFR, no, no, they already is, boss. So how do you think AA happened? A is not just RBI, A is for all regulators. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is the A system has been approved and architected at the FSDC level, mm -hmm. the Financial Stability Development Council, which is all the regulators with the finance minister sharing that group. So while RBI is the Actually, you know, the regulator in charge of making AA happen, the AA ecosystem applies to all sectors, which is why the SEBI and insurance and all have all come on board. So actually there's architecture now for creating a cross-sectoral cross approach to some things like account aggregator. You mentioned a very important point that the individual is going to own his data, he's going to give a consent. You also added a remarkable points in how the system developed in 2016. Uh, how do you see the whole behavior of the people from payment to credit to everything because the digital behavior of the people is also going to the next level and will they keep on expecting more from the financial institutions and therefore perhaps a challenge for financial institution also to serve the customers in a far more better way? No, no, I, I think they'll expect of course very consumer centric interfaces. They'll expect instant, like Praveen was saying, instant payment, instant everything, instant loan, so instant gratification. So all those demands will be there. Uh, so I think there will be very high uh, expectations uh, from the financial system. But it is also about getting a billion people in the system, right? That's really the heart of it. Okay. Uh India and developed countries, always a debate now, and India is going ahead. In fact, somebody said in the morning that India is 20 years ahead than many other countries. What is your view? How do you see the whole digital innovation taking India to a different uh, level altogether? Well, we, we, we have had the advantage in India of leapfrogging because we didn't have any infrastructure. And we built this infrastructure over the last 10, 15 years. So when you're building infrastructure now, you can build it in a different way. And you can, you know, you have a green field, you can design from scratch, you can address the limitations of other infrastructures. And now we are seeing the benefits of that. I give you many examples, right? Uh, you know, QR code, let's take QR codes versus POS machines. After 75 years, we have about 6 million POS machines. Maybe half of them happened during demon. Mr. Gandhi, I think half of them came, it went from 3 to 6 during demon only. 
in three years we have from zero to 50 million QR codes. I mean, so the scale of change is astonishing and two-factor authentication from day one. We are the only country which has public two-factor authentication. So your mobile phone is one factor. You can have a PIN, you can use the Aadhaar authentication. The fact that you can mix and match two-factor authentication is a whole new idea. So all these things are all very India-specific innovations because we don't have any legacy issues. Legacy is a big problem elsewhere. In fact, I, I remember on the pause part, sir, you crafted the digital payment report in 2019 where, you know, the sir had in fact given suggestions to the government that there should be a uh, uh, reducing GST for the merchants to actually buy POS terminals so that the payment will uh, go to the next level. So you mentioned about the unlocking the digital capital or the value specifically. Uh, most of the financial innovation companies operating in this space claims that they are unable to monetize that. If I ask you directly, how do you think the fintech companies or the tech companies operating in this space will unlock the digital value? That's up to their innovation. Yeah? I mean, it's up to companies to come up with innovative products and services for which consumers are willing to pay money. That's really what the thing is about. I mean, I think the rails have been laid. And when I talk to many of the uh, entrepreneurs, they all say that, yes, they have a plan to monetize. So it's up to, you know, it's really up to... That's, that's what business is about. Now, why are you an entrepreneur, right? So you have to figure out how to make money out of all this. But you may not make money by creating a moat, uh, like, like a, a gatekeeping kind of thing. You can't say, all payments go through me and I'll take my cut. That may not happen because the UPI will not, you know, UPI, there's no f fee at the moment, but maybe that will may, you know. So I think, but the fact you have, 300 million people or more, 250 to 300 million people using UPI, 50 million merchants paying with QR codes, sound boxes, this, that, all, all that are creating many, many opportunities to make money if you get it right. Okay, sure. So one question and then maybe I will open a floor to the people. If I will take just I one question. Dinner, yeah. Lunch, yes, yeah, yes, yes. I will on. just take one question, sir. But before that, you partly answered that. Going ahead, since you are talking about account aggregator, credit revolution has already been happening and so many innovations are happening. Going ahead, how do you see the whole financial innovation? Maybe two, three things that will lead India, you know, fast in a fast forward manner. As I said, we're going to go from prepaid to postpaid. So you're going to go from a few people getting access to credit to the whole country getting access to credit. When you can get access to credit to both buyers and sellers, then you turbocharge economic growth, right? So companies have credit so they can invest in inventory and hiring people. Consumers have credit so they can buy on EMI and all that. So both sides are getting turbocharged with this infrastructure. So that means economic growth goes up and India's credit to GDP ratio is much lower than other countries right now. So we can increase that. So I think you're going to see, and then once people realize that their digital footprint is their asset, then they'll be very careful not to jeopardize that. Just like, I don't want my credit score to be jeopardized. Tomorrow I'll realize that if my digital footprint, my digital capital is, yeah, I make some, I don't pay back a loan or something, then I won't get further loans. So once people realize that, then everybody will say, it makes more sense in this system to play by the rules because that's how I advance. So imagine if everybody realizes that playing by the rules is more valuable than not playing by the rules. It's pretty big. Okay, sure. I thought we'll take questions, but the time is up, sir. Before I wrap up, let me ask one quick question, sir. Not as a journalist, but the customer or the citizen of this country. How did you feel when somebody, maybe from a bank or some government agency, asked you for a verification and you showcased your Aadhaar card? How did you feel? It feels good. I mean, I just showed my Aadhaar on my DigiLocker just now when I came on the flight. It feels good. I mean, like, I'll give you an example. When I, last example, sometimes I take a taxi from my house to my office. The driver has a vaccination certificate, which we enabled through DPI, which, you know, digitally signed, QR code, all that. He's used Aadhaar to get the vaccination certificate. He goes through the toll gate where he pays fast tag, which again was part of our DPI and he refills fast tag with UPI. So from my home to my office, I, I meet four things which are all part of DPI. So this feels pretty good. Right, great. Thank you, thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
and mr bg mahesh will do the felicitation for this i am also calling upon team sarmati to quickly come on stage and get a picture with mr nandan Team Sahmati who's put this whole event together huge round of applause for them